In 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so we as preachers oftentimes tell people, you know, you don't need to be of the world. You don't need to love the world. Well, in that it's talking about the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. But we also emphasize Matthew 6, that says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And as we're preaching, we encourage people, don't get tangled up in the things of this world, but concentrate upon things that are out of this world, like heaven, God. After all, you know, Jesus told us that we lay up our treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt, where thieves cannot break through and steal. But here's the question. How do Christians live in this world but not be of this world? Well, that's, that's a challenge because we realize we have to make sure that we are doing things like providing, going to work, or maybe going to school, and that involves being of the world. We've got to engage with people that are of the world. Another example of this where it's difficult is what about things relating to government? That can be very challenging. I have many people that come to me and say, Guyton, what, what is my responsibility as a Christian to the government? That's what I want to examine today, is what is our responsibility as Christians to the government? Now, as we start this, I want to make sure I point out that I record this in the United States of America. I am an American and I'm proud to be an American citizen. But as we study God's word, it applies not only to those that live in a democracy or a republic, but God's word is also applied to the people that find themselves living in a dictatorship or in a communistic or socialistic government. And so God's answer to all of us is actually the same thing. Stay with me, don't go anywhere, because we're gonna answer this question with a Bible answer. Hi, I'm Guyton Montgomery, one of the preachers here at the Church of Christ at Milestone. Paul admonished Timothy to exercise himself unto godliness. We try and do this at our congregation through fellowship, prayer, worship, and of course, Bible study. We would like for you to take advantage of the things that we offer. You can learn more at cocmilestone.com or have a biblequestion.com or go to nwfsbs.org. Better yet, come visit us in person where you'll receive a warm, loving welcome. You know, the question of what is the relationship between the Christian and the government, some people would think it's kind of a unique thing to today in today's times or perhaps America, but I remind you, it's worldwide, but not only just to today's times, but it involved even New Testament Christians. Think about the Apostle Paul. Paul would actually write to young Timothy, a, a young preacher, encouraging him to have the right attitude and how he ought to be towards the government. Now remember, Paul, he was one that used his citizenship to get him out of certain situations, uh, but at the same time, he was also imprisoned by the government. If there was anybody that might would have animosity or confliction or, or something against the government, it would be Paul. But let's notice in our Bibles exactly what Paul would tell Timothy, this young minister, what he should do. We'll be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. He says here, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so we see really two things that, that really need to be made. Uh, a point of. First of all, we need to pray for our government, for our leaders. Now, I realize here in the United States we don't have kings, but we have presidents. We have those that are governors. We have those that are um, congressmen and senators and, and mayors and all these different levels of authority. But remember what he says here. He says, not just for kings, but for all that are in authority. And it's interesting because that would include um, soldiers when they're acting with the authority of the government. It would include our law enforcement. He says, you need to pray for them, make intercessions to God on their behalf. But not only 
did he say in verse 1 to pray? But point two I want you to remember is that we are to give thanks. So it's not just this idea of a tongue-in-cheek, kind of like the child that whenever his mama tells him to go and, and clean his room and he, he kind of stomps off and is like, well, okay, I guess I will. It's supposed to be with the right attitude. And the attitude is with giving of thanks. Now we're going to notice a little bit more why we should be giving thanks in some other passages. But isn't it interesting that, that Paul just outlines right here something very simple. We as Christians, when it comes to our government, when it comes to our leaders, we need to pray for them. We need to give thanks for them. Why? Well, look at this next phrase. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. What is? Going back. We're going to do this that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life, verse 2, in all godliness and honesty. See, the child of God, while we have to live in this world, we're not to be of the world as we spoke of. And our concerns are for the kingdom, Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not to prioritize the government and the things of this world over that which is spiritual. Our concern is how can we live the Christian life in peace? Now, as a citizen I, I get of the United States, we have the right to speak out in this country. And if you can do so in a, a legal way, in a way that is able to be peaceful, then that's good. But this idea of rioting and this idea of protesting, going against just being harsh and critical of our leaders, that just does not fit God's word. So what is the relationship between the Christian and the government? So far in 1 Timothy 2, we pray for them and we are thankful for them. Don't go anywhere. Right after a short break, we're going to notice from God's Word a third thing that God expects of us when it comes to our relationship or our responsibility with the government. When I study God's Word, it amazes me how many references there are to scientific things. But sometimes I struggle with that because I'm not always the best in science. That's why I'm thankful for Apologetics Press. They produce materials from Bibles to books to children's material that helps us as Christians to be able to understand how God's Word and science relate. I want to encourage you to go check them out at their website, apologeticspress.org. See them today. I hope you're enjoying the program. I want to tell you about a great opportunity that you can have your Bible questions answered. Every single Tuesday night, I'm joined here in the studio of the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies by Troy Spradlin, Jeff Orr, and Ray Brantley. Together, we answer questions with Bible answers. So join us every Tuesday night at 630 by searching for Have a Bible Question on YouTube, on Facebook Live, as well as our website and a podcast afterwards. So we've already noticed that the Christian should pray for his government leaders. He should also be thankful for his government leaders. But that alone just really is not enough. He needs to also obey his government leaders. Now we've already noticed 1 Timothy chapter 2 for the first two points. But for this, I want you to take your Bibles and, and go to Romans chapter 12 and, and follow along with me. Now, you need to realize the Apostle Paul here, he's writing to, to Romans. And in their government that existed at that time was a very corrupt, unrighteous government that existed. And really, if you look throughout all of history and you look at governments, there is a lot of corruption in governments. And I know some people don't want to admit it in certain ones, and I'm not going to get into those debates, but corrupt governments exist. But what does Paul say the Christian is to do? Let's start reading in verse 1. He says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now, the word subject there in the King James Version is the idea that you subject yourself, that you obey, you do what they say. Keep reading, it says, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And the word ordain actually means to set in order. We don't use that word as much. A lot of times people use it with the idea of an ordained minister but it just means the idea of something being set in order. And so here he says, for there is no power but of God, means that they wouldn't be, the government leaders would not be
be there if it wasn't for God. It also says that he's the one that set them in order. Now, I know in your mind, it's kind of like mine, most likely, that you wonder, but what about corrupt governments? Why would God give them power? Why would God set that in order? What we need to realize is that God looks at a bigger picture than we look at. Let's, let's consider the Old Testament. The nation of Israel were, came from Abraham, going back to Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, and they were supposed to be God's people. God creates this great nation. He leads them into a promised land, but the people forget about God. They go and they would rather serve other gods. They follow after the unrighteousness and immorality like the nations around them. And so God would send prophet after prophet to them, warning them and that, that they would be carried away. And so Assyria, a very corrupt government, was used by God to carry away Israel. And then Judah was warned over and over again that they would be carried away themselves if they don't repent, but they would not listen. And so God allows Babylon to come in and to carry away Judah into captivity. Now, why did God do all this? Well, as it says in the book of Ezekiel over and over again, so that they will be my people. They will know that I am God because he was trying to bring them back to him. And he knew it would take a form of discipline. It would take something drastic. And to do that, he utilized, he used corrupt governments. So sometimes when we look at the government and we say, why can this politician be this way? Or why can this government leader? Perhaps you're watching this because this is broadcast not only throughout the United States, but through YouTube, it can reach throughout the world. Maybe you live in a government where a dictatorship or some other form of uh, corruption exists. And you say, why could this be of God? Remember, God is carrying out his will throughout the world. And sometimes we're looking through a very small scope when he's looking at the bigger picture. But let's keep reading in verse 2. It says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And the ordinance there means he's resisting what God has put in order. He goes on and says, And they that resist shall receive of themselves damnation. Now that's very strong talk there. Because what he's saying is, is that you are condemning yourself if you resist the government or the, um, the leaders in government and you don't submit to them, you don't subject yourself to them, verse 1, because it's the same as rejecting God. Verse 3, he says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have the praise of the same. He's saying you ought to be fearful of the power that they have. What power? The power that God gave them, the authority to actually go against those doing evil. Look at verse 4. For he is the minister of God, meaning the idea of minister carrying out God's will. He is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And that's what government should be doing, is punishing those that do an evil. And he's saying that they would be justified if you rebel against them to use force, to use the sword against you. And, and they would be okay in that because you have brought the damnation on yourself by resisting them. Look at verse 5. He says, Wherefore you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Because as a child of God, we want to make sure we're doing what's pleasing to God. And if we want to be pleasing to God, we must subject, not only pray, not only be thankful, but obey the rulers that are over us. Now there is one exception to this, and we're going to talk about that right after this short break. I love reading and studying my Bible. In fact, I really enjoy studying God's Word with other people, whether it's face-to-face, -face, online, or through Bible correspondence courses. One of the favorite parts of my week is to come in and take a, 
uh, an envelope where we have sent somebody a, a course already with a postage page envelope. They've completed it and they've mailed it back to me. And I then take the course and I grade it and then I write a letter back to them with the next lesson so that they can continue studying God's Word. Would you like to take a Bible correspondence course with me? If so, we want you to call us, write us, or sign up online at your earliest convenience so together you and I can study God's Word some more. All right, so far we've noticed that whenever it comes to the Christian's responsibility to the government, he needs to pray, be thankful for, and obey the government. But as I told you before the break, there's actually an exception to this. Now, I caution you whenever it comes to exceptions. We should not be looking for exceptions all the time. In fact, these should be those rare situations, but sometimes they do exist. And we find one in the New Testament, and this is how we know that it does exist. If you want to follow along with me, I'm going to go to Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5. won't be able to read the whole thing, but there are some sections I'd like for us to notice. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, And as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Now, it's important to notate, or just kind of notice in here, that when you deal with the captain of the temple, the priest and the Sadducees, they were a form of government. Now, it was kind of weird the way the Roman laws worked, but the way it would be is that they would have princes and governors that would be over an area, and they would have different positions, and the Roman soldiers would be there. But as far as local groups of people, as far as like with the Jews, they would be allowed to govern their own people uh, for the most part, as long as they didn't violate Roman law. And the local governor, you know, he didn't really care as long as it was peaceful. When there wasn't peace, that's when he would step in. The only other exception is if somebody was a Roman citizen that always trumped, so, you know, let's say they're, the fact that they happen to be a Jew. Paul is a great example of that, is that he would, try, he would want to be tried by the Sanhedrin or by the uh, different councils of Judaism, but it would be his Roman citizenship that would protect him. So what we're dealing with here is government. And verse 2, it says, Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead, they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide, albeit many of them which heard the word believed. Now, we're going to jump forward. Uh, there's a sermon that's actually preached in this chapter. It would be great for you to read sometime. But we're going to come down to verse 16. And here it says, Saying, What shall we do to these men? Now, these are the ones, uh, the ones speaking here are the ones that uh, were listed in verse 1, those, those powers that be. And it says, for, for that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. So verse 18, it says, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God judge you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And uh, it says in verse 21, So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them. And so here is a command given by them. Don't preach any more of this. Don't talk about Jesus. But they say, you're going to have to decide. Uh, because whenever it comes to obeying God or obeying man, uh, we're going to obey God. In fact, if you go down to verse 23 and following, Peter will actually lead them in a prayer for boldness that they will choose to obey the laws of God that, that are in contradiction with the laws of man that they had been told. Well, you go forward in chapter 5, they actually get, lay hold on them again. And uh, they actually asked them the question in verse 28, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Verse 29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. And so what is the exception? The exception is when man's law um, prohibits you from fulfilling God's law, stands in contradiction that you cannot fulfill man's law and God's law at the same time, then God's law is supreme. These are the exceptions, though, and are very rare. 
And, and some of us have seen this, especially of late in our country. There are other countries uh, where this is probably more prevalent. And so what do we know that Christians are allowed to do? When they stand in contradiction, then you need to always choose God's law over man's. Notice the idea of subjection and humbling to each other. You know, that's the attitude of Christians. Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. It's actually here in verse 13. He says, Submitting yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto the governors, as unto them that are sent by, by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish man. As, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Now notice this in verse 17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. See, Peter didn't have the attitude uh, of go against government, government bad. He just said in Acts chapter 4, look, if you're going to tell me to do something, that God, um, not to do something that God has told me to do, then God's law is supreme. I will rather do what God says than you say. But as long as it doesn't st stand in contradiction, then that's what we're supposed to do. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2, you keep the ordinance. You subject yourselves. Why? Because he was one that was willing to pray, be thankful, and obey. We'll be right back. No matter what else is happening in the world, you will always find good news today. A proud partner of Have a Bible Question. A part of our program every week includes a question that Guyton and Troy answer for our viewers. Good News Today can be seen on many of the same television stations that air Have a Bible Question. You can also watch the program on our website, gnttv.org, or on your phone through our apps. We also have a channel on Roku and Apple TV, as well as episodes archived on YouTube. We'd love to have you join us. Since 1987, the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies has been providing college-level Bible classes tuition-free. In fact, I myself am a graduate of the school. I'm excited to announce that we are now 100% online, offering you the opportunity to utilize these courses to help you grow in your relationship with God. You can learn more so that you can prepare yourself for the next semester at nwfsbs.com. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. I realize the question, what is the responsibility of Christians to the government? To some people, it might not be a big deal. And to others, it's a really a, a massive uh, obstacle that they're facing because they see stuff that's being done. Perhaps they're living somewhere where unrighteousness is taking place and it's being done by the government itself. And so they get very emotional about the issue. But as in any topic, uh, and when we study, we need to take the emotion out of it. And we need to look to God's Word, the Bible, and see what it says. And that's what we've done today. We have just simply looked to what does the Bible say regarding what are the Christians' responsibility to the government, or what is the responsibility of Christians to the government. In doing so, we, we saw the Apostle Paul explaining to this young preacher, I want you to pray and give thanks for those people that are in position of power. And in fact, he says all men, but he specifies kings. Well, this fits exactly 1 Peter chapter 2 and down there around verse 17, I think it was, where, you know, he talks about the idea of your relationship to all men, to the brethren, to God, and he says in there that you honor kings. And so we are to pray, we are to give thanks, and as Paul wrote to the church at Rome, we are to submit, we are to obey and so I keep emphasizing that, the, the three things that I see in Scripture. And, and yes, there are, there's an exception. But it's like I tell people sometimes about exceptions. Sometimes we're just looking for that little clause. We're looking for that little exception. We need to realize that exception, most of the time, is a very rare occurrence. And it may depend. I realized during the 2020 pandemic, there were some places that, that people were told they cannot worship God that they could not assemble together despite God 
telling us that we're supposed to assemble and not forsake that assembly. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 and following. And so some Christians followed the example that we noticed in Acts chapter 4 and 5 of Peter, in which they would say, you know, you decide which one we ought to obey, whether we ought to obey God or man. And then he goes on and he says, it's better that we obey God than man. And so they went ahead and assembled. That's the exception. But the only time we have God's permission, according to his word, to go against the government, the powers that be, to our political leaders, according to God's word, is when you cannot, it's impossible to do what the government says and what God says and fulfill both. And in that situation, we simply obey God. Now we say all that. Do we as Americans uh, living in the United States have the right to speak out, to vote, to, to protest if we do it in legal ways? That's what we have the right. And I, I encourage all Christians to be able to use your legal ways wherever you happen to live in this world and to be able to, to stand for righteousness and encourage good, sound political leaders that will make laws that are in accordance with God's laws so that they can be the, the instruments, that they can be the ministers of God to execute wrath upon that which is evil. And so, yes, vote, do those things. But remember, our priority is to seek first the kingdom of God. That's what we're concerned about. We want to make sure our emphasis is placed and our hope is placed not upon some government, some king, some governor, but that our hope, our security, our faith is placed upon God, His righteousness, and His kingdom. I'll see you next week. Oh!